thank you for sharing prayer request. Uh, I think that's the most we've had go to Mike's, and I'm grateful for it. We've got to share with one another, church. We're a family, and so thank you for sharing your concerns and your requests with the rest of us that we could pray tonight. And I just want to support what uh, Brother Billy just said, that we need to take this sheet and look over it and pray through it, and not just on Wednesday night, but throughout the week. So please take time to do so. Everyone on that list is important, and they are in need. I want to thank you for praying for me and my family as well, as we have uh, dealt with sickness over the last two weeks, and it's, uh, it's good to be back tonight being able to preach God's Word. Since we're getting, beginning a new semester, I know some of you were not with us in the fall. I know some of you have forgotten everything I said in the fall. No. Uh, and so, uh, at least I've forgotten most of it. But anyways, um, let me summarize the first seven chapters of Daniel because we're going to jump into chapter 8 tonight. But before I do, let me begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, open the eyes of our hearts to receive your truth, to understand your word and to take comfort in that you have all things under control. In the world in which we live today, Lord God, we need to be reminded of that message. And so we say thank you that your sovereign plan will be achieved. And uh, so teach us through your word tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is a teenager. And him and some other choice young men from Jerusalem are taken by the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar back to Babylon, hundreds of miles away from their families, never to return home. Uh, When they get there, they're taught a a new language, a new culture, and they're fine with that. But when the Lord, uh, not when the Lord, but when the King Nebuchadnezzar calls for them to eat the king's choice meat, which most people would say, yay, I get to eat what the king eats, yay. But Daniel says, no, I can't do that because that meat has been offered to idols. And that goes directly against God's word. And so Daniel was Bible anchored in his teenage years. He had been taught well in Jerusalem before he was ever taken for the testing in Babylon. Then God granted his favor to him because of uh, that faithfulness. And then chapter 2, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him. He called in the wise men of Babylon, those that said they could interpret dreams and things and visions. And he called them in and says, tell me what my dream was and what it means. And no one could help him. And so then Daniel finds out about it and says, well, tell me the dream or or, or, give me some time actually. And Daniel came back, knew the dream and knew the interpretation of the dream. And in the dream, it was, a, it was a statue that he saw of different materials. The head was the Babylonian empire, it was a head of gold. And then you have silver and you have bronze and different materials in this vision that he saw. And so Daniel interpreted that form, letting him know that the, the Babylonians was, would be conquered by another group soon. And the, that group was the Medes and the Persians. And then in chapter 3, Uh, It addresses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three friends of Daniel that was also taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar had built this great big image, this statue in the land of Shinar, in the plain of Shinar there, and wanted all the world to gather and come and gather around it and all his governing officials to gather. And so it's, it's like everyone in politics going to Washington, every mayor, every alderman, city councilman, um, maybe even school board members, you can apply it to them. Everyone goes and worships this image. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't do it. They wouldn't bow the knee. And so they were taken captive. And you know the rest of the story. They were put in the fiery furnace and God spared them and provided for them just as he provided for Daniel in chapter one. And they come out of the fiery furnace and not a stench of smoke is upon them. Then in chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar has another troubling dream. And in this troubling dream, Daniel is the only one with the ability to interpret it. And he's brought in to interpret the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful, most wealthy man on planet Earth at that time. And it's a, it's a dream about Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to go from his position of power and influence and wealth, and he's going to be humbled And a year later, Nebuchadnezzar was on the top of his palace saying to himself, look what I have made. And God humbled him. 
And the vision that he saw a year ago that Daniel interpreted came to pass, for he was made to live like a wild animal, literally on all fours, literally having fingernails become claws and his hair growing long, and he lived like a wild animal for seven years. But then at the end of the seven years, God restored his, his mind to him, and he was humble, and he sought the Lord, and he returned to being king of Babylon as a worshiper of the one true God. I believe it's one of the most amazing stories of God's grace, and I believe he provided salvation for Nebuchadnezzar. I believe Nebuchadnezzar died a worshiper of the one true living God. Then in chapter 5, it jumps ahead multiple years, possibly 25 years, and multiple kings are skipped. And then it mentions King Belshazzar, that's also king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's now been dead for two decades. And Belshazzar is reigning, and he's having this great feast, and he's boasting about all that he's accomplished and showing off all of his wealth. In fact, he called for the, the vessels, the drinking vessels from the temple in Jerusalem that he took to be brought in, and they began to be dr- getting themselves drunk using the very vessels of the temple of the living God. And that night, he saw a hand appear writing on the wall which is where we get the phrase, the writings on the wall. And it terrified King Belshazzar. So what does he do? He calls for all his interpreters, all his wise men to come in and tell him what does it mean? And no one could except, you know, who? Daniel. And Daniel came in and told him that the kingdom would be taken from him. And that night, while the party was going on, the Medes and the Persians had entered the city and they conquered Babylon and Belshazzar died that night. Chapter 6 jumps ahead in time too. Daniel went to Babylon as a teenager, but now in chapter 6, he's maybe 85 years old. And he's third ranking in all of Jerusalem, not in all of Jerusalem, in all of Babylon. He's the third, top three right under the king. And he's even got greater favor than the other two. And so everyone's jealous of him. And so they want him out. They're corrupt and they make these side deals. But Daniel's an upright man of integrity, doesn't do any of that. And so they want to remove him. And so they go to the king and they flatter him and say, hey, king, why don't you issue an edict for 30 days that no one can pray to any God except you? Now, why 30 days? Why not forever? Well, 30 days because that's enough to get Daniel. Daniel would not stop praying to the one true God. So the king, the king asked, do all the wise men, all my, all my prefects, all my high-ranking officials, do they agree to this? And, and they said, yes, well, that's not true. Daniel had not agreed to it. So Daniel began, kept praying, and they, they arrested him for praying to his God, the one true God. You know the rest of the story. He was taken. The king now knows he's been tricked. He tries to get saved Daniel, but he can't because it's an edict that cannot even be provo- uh, revoked by the king. And so Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. But come the next morning, the king goes to the den and says, uh, Daniel, has your God delivered you? And he said, oh, yes. Yes, he has. And Daniel comes out, and those that misled the king were thrown in, and they didn't make it out. They perished there with the lions. Now, chapter 7, which we studied to end last semester, chapter 7 was a, is a very difficult uh, vision dream. And in chapter 7, it backs up in time. Okay, if we were studying this chronologically, we would be studying chapters 7 and 8 before chapters 5 and 6. Okay, it backs up in time because chapter 7 is a vision Daniel sees. And chapter 8 that we'll study tonight is also a vision that Daniel sees. And so he needs someone else to interpret those for him. And so in chapter 7, he sees this, this vision And it's about the the four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in chapter 2. It's about the Babylonian Empire, then being conquered by the Mede and Persian Empire, which is then conquered by the Greeks, and the Greeks were then conquered by the Romans. But in chapter 7, it also talks about this little horn, which we believe is the Antichrist, that will come on the scene in the end. So it talks about what's happened in history, but also what we believe is still future for us. 
Now we arrive at Daniel chapter 8. If you haven't turned there yet, turn there with me now, please. Daniel chapter 8. And please fasten your seatbelts because I've got 32 minutes to cover what I could say in 62. All right? It's a lot of stuff, and it's very hard to divide this chapter. Uh, I would spend 15 minutes summarizing the message next week to start. So we're going to try to cover it in one night the entire chapter of chapter 8. All right? In this vision, it's addressing two of those four empires, the, the Medes and the Persians and then the Greeks, and then we're going to study about the little horn as well. All right? So the title of the message is The Ram, the Goat, and the Little Horn. The Ram, the Goat, and the Little Horn. So hope you have your thinking caps on. You're going to need them tonight, all right? Here we go. We can do it one bite at a time, right? All right, we're going to go through the text as we, as we go through the message, okay? They're going to be, I'm going to be sharing the scriptures from throughout the chapter as we work, it, work our way through it. So let's start with number one, the setting. And the outline is on the back of the prayer sheet for you. If you haven't noticed that, if you turn the prayer sheet over, you'll find the outline for tonight. Number one, the setting in verses one and two. In the third year, the reign of Belshazzar. So again, we back up now to the time where the Babylonian king is in power. Belshazzar the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. So the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, we believe, is 550 B.C. Okay, so uh, Daniel has been in Babylon for, six, uh, let's see, 55 years uh, he's approximately 70 years old at the time of this vision. Verse 2, and I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside Ulai Canal. Now, where's the citadel of Susa? Does anybody remember anything I, I taught from Esther last spring? All right, all of that took place in the city of Susa. And that book starts in 483 B.C., okay? So that book is 60, 70, 80, 90 years of, of what took place after this in 550 B.C., okay? Uh, but that, the story of Esther's in Susa because the Persians are the empire at that time. All right, so Daniel's seeing this vision, and he's either there in person or in the vision he simply is taken there. I don't think it matters which interpretation you have. And what he's seeing is there in Susa. He's not seeing what's happening in Babylon. He's seeing what's happening in Susa, which is about 220 miles east of Babylon, which is some distance in those days. All right. All right. So the, the Ulai Canal was about 900 feet wide, so 300 yards. I mean, this, is, this canal is quite wide. Much travel could happen throughout, uh, you know, up and down this canal. So now let's, we've talked about the setting. Number two, what Daniel saw. First, the ram. The ram. Verse 3 says, Then I lifted my eyes, and I looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up fast. The two horns represent the Medes and the Persians. All right, this is the, this is the, the, the ram is picturing the Mede and Persian empire. Now, how do we know this? Well, verse 20 of chapter eight actually tells us. So look there, please, chapter eight, verse 20. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. And one was coming up a little higher than the other one because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. Okay? Now here's an interesting thing. Here in this country, our emblem, our, our animal is the bald eagle. All right? It is the animal uh, representing the United States of America. Well, the animal for the Medes and the Persians, their national symbol when they were a great empire was a ram. And here it is in God's word before they are the great empire talking about Daniel seeing a ram. Really cool stuff. Verse 4, he says, I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue 
from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. That's simply just talking about the the power of the ram. The Medes and the Persians come on the scene. They're conquering enemy after enemy after enemy. They conquer the Babylonians uh, there uh, on the night Belshazzar was having that feast. Um, and when that, this happens, they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to have any match. They're going to be able to defeat every foe, and they're going to expand the empire. And that's all that verse 4 is talking about is the power of this realm. Now, what is kind about when the Medes and the Persians do take power is that Cyrus, the Persian emperor, is the one that allowed the Jews to return from Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. 50,000 Jews, when the Persian, Medes and Persians take over the Babylonians, 50,000 Jews return. And so the, the, the Medes and Persians were uh, more friendly to the Jews than the Babylonians had been. Second, the goat. The ram represented the Mede and Persian empire, now the goat. Verse 5, while I was observing, <clears throat> behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. The phrase from the west is simply letting us know of the Greek empire. The Greeks were from the northwest, uh, north of the Mediterranean Sea, north, northwest from where the Babylonian and Mede and Persian empires were before her. All right, and so that's where the Greeks will come from. Verse 21 lets us know about this goat. It says, the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So here we have a a unicorn goat type. All right, we got one horn, all right, coming out of this goat. And that horn is representing the first king. That's Alexander the Great, which if you've studied history, Um, world history than you've heard about him. He was a great military strategist. He was born in 356 BC. Now remember this, this vision is in 550 or so. But now the vision is talking about what's going to happen 194 years or more than that. But he was born 194 years later. Okay. He was born in 356. Uh, He followed his father, Philip the Macedon, who was a great conqueror himself. And when Alexander the Great was 20 years old in 336 BC, he succeeded his father as the king of the Greeks. 20 years old. Now the phrase in verse 5, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground, speaks of the swiftness of the Greeks. The Greeks like to attack in a secret way and very swift in small groups. The Babylonians and Medes and Persians, they like to conquer in one massive attack. But the Greeks had different methods, and they would spread their people out. They would let some attack for a time and then attack from another area, from another direction for a time, et cetera, et cetera. But they were very quick. They attacked before you knew it was coming. It's not like they got on an open battlefield and people could see them coming. They, they attacked in more of a secret way. And the speed here that it references the goat speaks of that. Back in chapter 7, the uh, Grecian empire is referenced by a leopard. All right, you got, you got a lion, a bear, and a leopard in chapter 7's vision. The leopard speaks of the swift, quick animal, obviously, and that, that represented the Greek empire. So we see chapter 7, chapter 8 saying the same thing. Not only about who they are, but how they fought. And it came to pass that way. Now verse 6, he, the goat, came up to the ram. So now we've got the goat, the Greeks, and the ram, the Medes and Persians, that had two horns. And it says, which I had been standing in front of the canal and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. The goat is now rushing at the ram. And he will defeat the ram. Why? Because in human history, the Greeks go on to defeat the Medes and the Persians. What God is telling Daniel in this vision came to pass just as the Lord prophesied. We can trust God's word. And again, verse 20 and 21 lets us know who these empires are talking about, the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. It tells us. 
So there's no debating that portion of it. So for 150 years, the Medes and Persians were in power. Many times they would try to conquer Greece. I remember teaching from the book of Esther and uh, her husband, the, or before she was married to him, but anyways, the, the king at the beginning of the book of Esther, he had tried to go into Greece and conquer it and he had failed. All right, and so the Medes and Persians had been trying to conquer the Greeks for many, many years. And when we get into 300s, Alexander the Great knows this, and he takes care of the Medes and the Persians. And the Greeks become the world power. Look with me in verse 7. Daniel says, I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram who had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. And all that means is the Greeks conquered the Medes and Persians. Okay? Medes and Persians could not stand up to them. So 18 months after Alexander the Great became king, of the Greeks, he attacked and conquered the Medes and Persians. Within three years, they were completely the world power. He had conquered all of the Medes and Persians in every location. And they had dominance from Greece, north of the Mediterranean Sea, on, on around it, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, down to Egypt and way to the east to India. All of that was under the rule of the young leader, Alexander the Great. Verse 8. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. The male goat here, again, the Greeks and specifically Alexander. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. The large horn speaking of the king. And its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Here's something true about Alexander the Great. He died at the age of 32. 20, he becomes king. Within three years, he has totally dominated the Medes and Persians. The Greeks are now the world power. He's expanded their influence, their land, their wealth, all of that. And within 10 years later of his life, with all of that power, he is dead. It is guessed that he died from malaria, but he came down with a terrible fever and never recovered. What's that teach us? The most powerful, wealthiest, human being on planet earth cannot escape the time when it is for them to go. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what influence you have. It doesn't matter what, how great you think you are. You are at the mercy of the Lord. And Alexander the Great made it 32 years. He left two sons. Guess what happened to them? They died. After a period of struggle, the empire said, let's just have four successors, which are the four conspicuous horns that rise up. The horn gets broken off. That's Alexander dying. And then the four horns coming up is that the empire of the Greeks was divided into four regions. And they basically had four leaders, which these regions were huge. I mean, Each of these regions is larger than the size of Texas. I mean, it's a large large land area when you have no airplanes or automobiles. All right? And so now there's four. Before I proceed with that, though, I went over that our national emblem is the bald eagle. And the national emblem for the Medes and the Persians, their animal that represented them was the ram. It doesn't take long to figure out that the Greeks their animal was the goat. Literally, in human history, outside of the Bible, if you study what is the national emblem animal for the Greeks, they're going to show you a goat. And that's exactly what was prophesied, the animal that was prophesied to Daniel in 550 B.C. Now let's talk about third, the little horn. Verse 8 ends with four horns coming up from the male goat. Okay, so now verse 9, out of one came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. After Alexander died, they divided the empire into four horns. Now, 
to fill in what this little horn means, we have to really, we go to what most scholars do is they go to human history and they fit in who would have been this little horn that fulfilled what it describes of this little horn. And what scholars come up with is Antiochus IV Epiphanes that lived and reigned from 175 to 163 BC. So now we jump basically 175 years after Alexander the Great, 150 years after he reigned. And here comes this man, Antiochus. Antiochus purchased his position of authority. He intimidated people. He bought people off in order to become king. He gave himself the name Epiphanes. This is all under his arrogance in your outline here, all right? He, he gave himself the name. Epiphanes means illustrious. Antiochus, the illustrious. The man wasn't lacking for confidence, all right? Next, I want you to see his contempt. Look in verse 9. It says, Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the beautiful land. So again, this is one of the four horns, but the beautiful land, I believe, is a reference to Israel, a reference to Palestine, a reference to the promised land. And so Antiochus, he had authority over that portion, and so he fits with that description. Next, let's look at his impact. Verse 10, it, the little horn, grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. This horn became very powerful, very influential. Remember, Daniel's seeing a vision. Four horns on this goat, and then this little horn springs up, and now it springs all the way into heaven, and stars start falling, okay? It's it's a dream. It's a vision. And we believe that those stars falling is this horn piercing people's lives, and Jews actually were dying and being severely persecuted. Antiochus' persecution of the Jews began in 171 BC when he had the high priest at the temple assassinated. In 168, three years later, he had 20,000 men to level the city of Jerusalem. They entered the city on the Sabbath of all days murdered most of the Jewish men and took most of the women and children as slaves. The remaining men ran to the Jewish military leader named Judas Maccabeus. Now verse 11, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of hosts. This little horn that springs up, this this military leader, this commander, this one that's reigning over a fourth of the Grecian Empire, makes himself equal with God, the commander of hosts. And it's believed that Antiochus went into the temple and declared himself to be God in the Jewish temple. Whether that's true or not, I cannot be for sure. What we do know is he hated Judaism. And he wanted all Jews not to worship the one true God, but to worship him. In the second part of verse 11, it says he, and it being the horn, removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. He had the temple severely damaged and destroyed. He removed the the sacrificial system that was taking place in the 200s BC and leading up to 170 BC. On December 14th, 168 B.C., Antiochus replaced the Jewish altar at the temple with the altar of Zeus, the Greek god, and then he sacrificed a pig, of all animals, a pig, on that altar there at the temple. He hated the Jews. Let's look at verse 12. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. What this vision is, God's revealing to Daniel in this vision is, there's going to come a day when this this horn here will get his way. He's going to have his way. Those that oppose him will suffer. They will die. He will win. God's letting them know the future. It's going to happen this way. And it did happen that way. 
for many Jews were slaughtered. Verses 13 and 14. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Great suffering would come upon the Jews. And 2,300 here is debated. Some say it's 2,300 evenings and mornings, so you split the number in half to know how many total days. If you split it in half, it's basically three years. You leave it at 2,300, then it's basically six years. Both of those times fit with Antiochus Epiphanes. Because if he started with the assassination of the high priest and went from then on, then it took six years of suffering upon the Jews. If he went to the start of the temple when he destroyed the temple, then it would be three years of great suffering upon the Jews. Either way, either way you interpret it, it fits with Antiochus. Now let's look at verses 15 through 19. Everybody kind of move around a little bit, okay? It's like the last five minutes of class and the lecture has gone on for a long time. All right? We got, we got 11 minutes. I'm, I'm doing great on time. I hope you're still with me here. Uh, there's a lot of suffering and death and, okay, but we're going to get there. I mean, that's, this is God's word. It's profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof and training in righteousness, right? All right, verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Ulai. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to me and I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that this vision pertains to the time of the end. Now, while he was talking to me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. So there's a man there in this dream vision that speaks to Gabriel, and I believe this is the angel Gabriel, the same one that appears in the New Testament to announce uh, you're going to give birth to a son. His name's going to be Jesus. All right? And so that same Gabriel, I believe, is the one here in Daniel's vision here, and, and he's seeing all this, and he's talking to him, and then Daniel falls asleep, then he wakes him up, and he stands him upright so that he can tell him about the final period. Notice verse 17, what he says, son of man, understand the vision pertains to the time of the end, the time of the end. Now we can apply the time of the end to the time right before the first coming of Christ, but most interpret the time of the end to speak of what's still future. So some of this vision here is not just something that happened in human history, like Antiochus, but it's picturing something that's going to happen. Verse 19, notice there, he says, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation. That, that would sound like future, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. And so, interpreters, translators say that this is speaking of a human event in time where there's the first fulfillment of this was Antiochus, but the ultimate, bigger fulfillment of this is the future Antichrist. Okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says this of the Antichrist, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So the same way that Antiochus promoted himself as God, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. And so this, this prophecy would fit a description of the Antichrist as well that will display himself as being God. Let's now look at verses 23 through 25, okay? 23 through 25. 
It says, in the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy an extraordinary, to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. And he will destroy mighty men and, a, and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in the heart, in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princesses. Most scholars believe verses 23 through 25 is talking about the Antichrist. Okay? He's the one that has power that's extraordinary. He's going he's to destroy to an extraordinary degree. He's going to prosper and perform his will for a season. He's going he's to cause deceit, and he's going to succeed with his influence. He's going to magnify himself. All those things fit the Antichrist. Now, let's go to number four. The conclusion of this little horn. Who, again, the little horn, the first fulfillment is Antiochus, and I have no trouble agreeing um, and speculating that the little horn's ultimate fulfillment is the Antichrist here. So his conclusion, verse 25, the end of it, it says, He will be broken without human agency. See, we know he's going to have great influence. Many people are going to suffer, be persecuted, and even see death. That occurred at the time of Antiochus. Uh, it's also going to occur when the Antichrist is on the scene. He's going to do great damage for three years to the people of Israel, we know, and really to all who oppose him. But then there's going to come a time when he's broken. He's going to get his due. He's going to reap what he sowed, has sown. Now, let's first apply verse 25 to Antiochus, okay? He was also broken beyond any human agency. You have to read some about it in the, in the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees, there's two of them. It's in the Old Testament Apocrypha. So it's not in God's Word. It's not officially God's Word, but it does record human history, all right? And it tells what, a lot of what happened in those silent years between Malachi in the 400s BC and the start of the New Testament. And here we're talking about history that took place uh, around, what, 175 to 160 BC. So that fits the time of Judas Maccabeus. He was the leader. And uh, we believe, I don't know if he's the writer of the Maccabees or not. And quite honestly, I want to make it clear, I have not read the book of Maccabees. But that records the Jewish fighting where they are standing up for themselves. And when it comes to Antiochus, he died when Judas Maccabeus and his men came to liberate Ju uh, Jerusalem from Antiochus. Antiochus came down with abdominal pain, severe, and he died. He fell out of his chariot and he died from the fall. And they said worms had eaten his insides. <clears throat> On December 14th, 165 B.C., Jerusalem was delivered from Antiochus, Epiphanes, by Judas Maccabeus and his followers. The temple worship and sacrificial system was restored. Jewish people were able to go to the temple and pray. And today the Jews celebrate December 14th for a reason. It's called Hanukkah. It's called the Feast of Lights. It is the day that Judas Maccabeus led the, the Jewish leaders into Jerusalem and took back the temple area and freedom for Jews to, to uh, <clears throat> worship. And so they celebrate that even to this day. So Antiochus came to his end. It was a painful end and a quick end. When it comes to the Antichrist, Revelation chapter 19, I believe, speaks of him. If the beast in Revelation is the Antichrist, then Revelation 19, 20 tells us what will happen to him. It says, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. 
These two were thrown into the lake of fire with, which burns with brimstone. What's going to happen to the Antichrist? If he's the beast in Revelation 19, which many believe he is, and I tend to believe he is, then he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Please hear me. There's a, this is just a side note. This is a lesson on hell. Hell is not the devil's home. The lake of fire, the false prophet's going to be thrown into it, and he's going to be suffering torment. The beast, the Antichrist, is going to be thrown into it, and he's going to be suffering torment. You go another chapter in Revelation, and you find out the devil's going to be thrown in there, and he's going to suffer the torment. The lake of fire is God's creation to judge. It is not the devil's home where he relaxes and puts his feet up and lay, you know, sits back. Uh-uh. Okay? And hell is going to, locations of hell are throughout the Bible. You got, you got Hades and hell now, but then it says in Revelation, Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the uh, future, eternal, final hell. I never thought about that, have you? Hell is going to be thrown into hell is what I'm saying. Hades is going to be thrown into the lake of fire as the final destination. All right, that's just a little side note. All right, if you got any questions about that, sorry, I can't go any further with it. Don't know anymore. All right, number three and final, Daniel's immediate response. Look in verse 27. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got, I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. None to explain it, but a lot of it's explained here in the text. We know the Medes and the Persians are mentioned here in the text. We know the Greeks are mentioned here in the text. And so we know who is being referred to in a lot of this vision, this dream. I want you to ponder Daniel for a moment. It's 550 or so B.C. He loves the Lord. He's faithful to the Lord. And he sees a vision where he knows that there's going to be an empire that's great and mighty. And it doesn't imply that it's the current one. But then there's going to be another one that conquers her. But then there's going to be this this horn that rises up that's going to cause great bloodshed. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad on his own people and his own ancestors to come. And so he's troubled. What does it say here? He's exhausted and sick. He's astounded at the vision, but he's exhausted. He's sick because it's not all pleasant. Please hear me. Knowing the future is not always a good thing. (laughs) And here Daniel received what he really didn't want to know. It was important for God to communicate it, but he wasn't excited about what he just found out. He was troubled. He was astounded by it. He was exhausted by it. And no one could tell him all the meaning of it. But now he's recorded it, and we get to look back and see how each segment of it was fulfilled and how God keeps his word. And so there's a great sense of encouragement for you and for me, because if God can tell Daniel in 550 what's going to happen in 333, in 323, then he can take care of you and me in 2022. If he can tell Daniel what's going to happen in the 100s BC and even what's going to happen in the end times that hasn't happened yet, then you can rest assured God's got it under control in this world today, in this chaos that we live in today. That we can press on by faith, that we can trust in the Lord, that when we read his word, we don't got to read and doubt, we can read and trust because he will keep his word. It's reliable, it's dependable. That's the reason. That is a key reason that chapter 8 is in the Bible for you and I to show that God knows and God's in control. Yes, there's some in the future that's going to be bad. It's going to be real bad. The New Testament talks about it. Jesus talked about it. The abomination of desolation is not going to be pretty. People are going to be running for the hills, it says. But we do know what's coming even after that. 
And I'm so glad I can read of the four walls of the new heaven and new Jerusalem that comes down. And the streets of gold and the pearly gates. And there's no need for the sun because the Lord is the light of heaven. That's good enough for me. We're on the winning team. Along the journey, it might be rough, but you're on the winning team. Remember who you belong to and take comfort. Let's pray. Lord God, you are good. And Lord God, we don't always receive the best of news and the news that doesn't trouble us, but we always receive from you the news we need at the time. So Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Daniel chapter 8 and what you showed to Daniel through that vision and what you have now fulfilled throughout human history. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given us understanding of your word and that you have shown us that your word is reliable. Lord God, help us to be steadfast. Help us to love others. Help us to love you and to love the lost and to live for you, to shine for you, and to be steadfast in the faith in spite of the circumstances and challenges around us. Strengthen us, O oh Lord, to be used by you and to bring honor to you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.